Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is NG808, the Cutting Edge, here on a given Monday. And uh, we are joined by our regular contributor, Marco Mangelstorff, who joins us from somewhere far away. Where are you, Marco? Saratoga, California, in the South Bay Area, next to San Jose and Los Gatos. Okay, good to hear that. I hope things are safe for you. So this is this and that. Um, which I, I think that's a really an interesting way of looking at energy. Um, this is uh, the Hawaii energy stew, if you will. And we're looking at several issues. We're trying to get a handle on where it all goes. You know, it's like it goes in generations, doesn't it? And you can identify a period of years and say, you know, this was the period of years that we did this and focused on this. And this is the period of years we we're focused on that. And it changes from time to time, and it's not the same. You know, you have generations of people and, you know, business owners and government officials coming in and leaving. It's all kind of a sine curve, a rotation, a generational shift, if you will. So my first question to you, Marco, is in what generation are we now? Oh, man, talk about a curveball question, Jay. For, well, first, let me, let me say something about the stew and the stew metaphor, okay? It's actually, it's an outtake from uh, uh, our beloved Israel Kamaka Viva Ole, who left us way too soon back in 1995. And I have all his music. And one of the outtakes was, uh, you know, he recognized, uh, you know, in his 30s, he was uh, morbidly obese. He had lost a number of relatives to obesity. And, you know, uh, having that much uh, strain on the body, of course, can cause the body to wear out faster. And he was saying, you know, uh, you know, no need to fear death. No need to fear death. Uh, I'll be there. I'll be there keeping the stew warm for you, you know. And so that's where I got the stew metaphor for today's uh, Hawaiian stew for, from Brother Is, Israel Kamaka Vivole. Uh, you know, what generation we're in right now? I think we're generation question mark. At least that's the way I feel right now uh, on so many different levels. And, you know, as far as the energy scene in Hawaii goes, I think there, there are more question marks that I've ever had before in the, the decades I've been in the energy arena in Hawaii. And we seem to be moving forward at a fast clip in this area and less fast in another area. And it just seems to be getting uh, more and more kind of kapakahi, to use another favorite Hawaiian word of mine. And so we're generation question mark. That's my answer to your question, my friend. Okay, I think implicit in that is the notion of we're in between. We're in between something, and we have yet to realize the outlines, the, the sharp outlines, if you will, or the sharper outlines of the generation emerging. And, and by the way, it's a double entendre. It's not just a generation of businessmen and public officials, the generation of the public, of, of the kids, of the ones who are going to operate Hawaii in the future, the ones who are going to be around when we are supposed to meet our target goals. You know, that's really, I hope they're watching and thinking about this because we are relying on them to take the reins at some point. Anyway, so let's connect the dots. Let's find some dots to connect. Uh, let's uh, look at the stew, if you will, um, and, and talk about, um, you know, this and that. What do you got? Ah, uh, this and that. Well, uh, there was a piece uh, of this and that in the New York Times yesterday by my friend Ivan Penn. He's a L.A.-based uh, journalist for the New York Times, kind of kind of increasing my circle of New York Times friends and relatives. I got my cousin Hannah in Bangkok, and I got Ivan in Los Angeles. And he and Clifford Krauss did a good piece on uh, kind of the new energy landscape uh, on the mainland, uh, which is you know, especially under the Biden administration, but this was going on even before Biden under Trump and Obama, where these uh, big, 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 big gigawatt power plants of uh, wind and solar are going up. And uh, they're going up, especially, you know, as you might think uh, or, or believe the, in windy places like Texas and the Plain States and sunny places like SoCal or Arizona. Now, the issue is, uh, oftentimes these windy areas where you have these 400 foot turbines or you have acres and acres and acres of solar are not really near uh, per population areas where the population is where they use the most power, right? So the question is, how do you get power from one dot to the other? The one dot being a wind farm hundreds of miles away from Dallas or Houston 
or, or a solar farm hundreds of miles away from the Bay Area or from Los Angeles. And the infrastructure of transmitting grid power across state lines and across the continent is rather aged, right? Hence, amongst other things, Biden's big push for an infrastructure bill of a trillion or more dollars uh, to redo uh, the nation's infrastructure, including power. So it kind of got me thinking, well, that's an interesting, and it's not, not as if I had never heard of that before on the mainland, but I got to thinking, you know, what about here in Hawaii? Well, no, I'm not here in Hawaii now, but what about our home in Hawaii? And, you know, we're not gonna have underwater power cables in my lifetime or your lifetime, Jay. I, I feel very confident in saying that it's not gonna happen. So we've got these isolated island grids and we don't have copious amounts of land available, especially on Oahu where land use issues, land use debates, land use antipathy or, 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 or uh, negative juju in terms of what to do with land is, is, at a, is at a peak right now, whether it's a wind farm at Kahuku or you know, possible wind farm uh, on the view plane there in the ocean. Uh, we, we don't, we're not dealing with transmission difficulties over thousands of miles like the mainland. We're dealing with land use issues, a lack of adequate land, contentious land, especially on Oahu. And we're, we, we're kind of taking, a, we, we've got different problems, different challenges in Hawaii when it comes to energy. It's uh, whose backyard is it gonna go in? Is it equitable to be on the North shore that already has big tall wind turbines? is uh, does it make more sense to double down on distributed energy resources, also known as distributed generation, or as Hawaiian Electric is calling it, customer energy resources, DER, CER, BFG, uh, and all kinds of uh, acronyms that uh, we can come up with. So it, it's just a very fertile time right now. On the mainland, it's, they need more power, they need to retire fossil fuel burning power plants, especially coal. Nat gas is a stopgap measure that has really stepped up to offset declining coal and oil. And in Hawaii, we've just got a, got a different stew that we're, we're tending to. And let me, let me uh, uh, give you some thoughts about what you've said. It really reminds me of the whole issue about the undersea cable. I never, I mean, I, there's a lot of activist issues where activists won. And, uh, you know, you're right, they're, they're winning on the NIMBY issue. Um, and it's become more and more difficult to generate electricity using, um, you know, substantial community resources uh, in Oahu. I, I would not, um, you know, favor this distributed thing because I think favors people who have the money to participate. It does not favor the rest of us. And um, you know that's 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 a problem. So at the end of the day, you really have to have common resources. But our our possibilities for common resources are narrowing because people don't want it in their backyards. This is very troubling because at the end of the day, just like Biden says, we need a we need a grid that goes around the country. Look what happened in Texas. That was the failure of, of national thinking of, of interstate grid thinking. And, and we don't have that because we gave up, and you say it's during your lifetime and mine, we won't have an undersea cable, but you know, why not? What was the problem? Um, you know, this, this is sort of like the super ferry. We don't wanna connect the islands and there's people out there who have very self-interested reasons for not connecting the islands. But at the end of the day, if we have more resources say in, in the Hawaii Island and we wanna, bring those resources for the benefit of Hawaii Island and um, Oahu, then we should do that. The technology is uh, not that complicated. Even the cost is not that complicated, um, but it's a, it's a philosophical ideological thing where people don't want the islands connected. My island, not your island. And that's um, you know, a really problematic direction the state has already taken. But at the end of the day, wouldn't it be better, Marco, to have a statewide grid? Wouldn't it be more sustainable, more resilient to have other options instead of options that run into NIMBY all the time? Well, my dear friend Jay, and in the better, best of all worlds, you know, there would be unicorns that would be multicolored and there would be pigs, some of them that would be flying. 
right? I mean, wouldn't it be better if uh, we, in the words of that great philosopher, Rodney King, can't we just all get along better? Sure. But I mean, I beg to differ, my friend, in terms of uh, the cost of, of a inter-island deep sea cable uh, that would connect all the islands. I mean, we're talking b -b 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 billions, right? And I've never even seen an estimate over the decades of what a uh, cost would be to connect all the islands. The, the only estimates I've seen is essentially Molokai, Lanai, Maui to Oahu, and that's a slam dunk compared to getting cable to the big island. So I think cost is a big, big deal when you're talking b -b 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 billions and there's no longer a Daniel Kianoi in Washington who was so instrumental in bringing pork, speaking of pigs, pork home to the state, you know, where's the bill, where are the billions going to come from? So I well, think that's, no, that's, that's true. But remember, as we go forward, lack of an, an interstate grid is uh, intrastate grid is going to cost us. Who is to say how much? But right now, as we have both agreed, we're sort of in an interim. Um, we don't know exactly how we're going to meet our goals. We know a lot of resistance and challenge points which also will cost a lot of money. When I think of um, you know, putting in 10, maybe 15, maybe even 20 billion from rail into an, a, an undersea cable, it's an easy choice. Uh, granted, we don't have a lot of spare cash right now. COVID costs us a lot. Our economy is still limping along. Um, but bottom line is uh, over time, my view, and I, I, we can differ on, on logistics, but my view is that we're gonna have to do this because Oahu is simply going to run out of, what do you want to call it, legal space. We're running out of legal space. So, okay, there we go on that issue. Let's go to another issue. I always ask you for the next issue, and you, you take me to a surprise place. Do you want me to take you to the surprise place, or are you going to take me to the surprise place, Dave? No, you always take me to a surprise place. I never know where you're going. <laughs> go for it. Oh boy. Well, I'm just going to, I'm not going to let that uh, previous issue go for right now because philosophically, I just don't see the political will, the, 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 the backing of the citizenry of the so-called neighbor islands, which some people refer to over the years as the outer islands. We, we people who live on the neighbor islands sure don't like that outer island moniker. I just don't see the will being there and the people of Kauai, Molokai, Lanai, Maui, the big island to have wind turbines or monster solar plants to feed Oahu. That to me is, is a political dead end. It's a non-starter. I'm not, I'm not so, talking about political. I'm talking about <laughs> sustainability and resilience and technology and the reality of it. Forget political for a moment because political in Hawaii is often, may I say this, often irrational. Uh, I, I don't want to be the one to break this to you, Brother Jay, but Political is a big part of our reality in Hawaii. I'm, I'm sorry if that's too much of a blow on this Monday, but it is in fact true. Well, on the other hand, political changes. It changes for those generations we mentioned. It does. It, change, it changes with the physical realities. If I tell you that it's going to cost more and more in Oahu um, for energy that's renewable, you know, under our mandate to give up coal, for example, and uh, the governor's um, you know, ruling that there will be no LNG here, uh, and we have to go um, you know, renewables, and we don't have the space for it, those things are gonna change the way it works. They're gonna change, may I say, they're gonna change the political. So <clears throat> you can say that right now, it's not a good political climate for this. Uh, and you know, it may stay that way for a while. At the end of the day, there's gonna be some young folks that get into the legislature, or into elected office and say, wait a minute, we really need to have a statewide system. And my view, and it is philosophical, is the islands should be connected. I met a woman on the street not too long ago, and I said, did you know that the islands are drifting away from each other? <laughs> uh, I said that, that we have a phenomenon which I refer to as insular drift. And part of it is a difficulty of getting around. We don't have the ferry and the planes um, you know, are still you know, very expensive. And it's hard to travel, even see your family. And I, I feel there is a, a, an identifiable phenomenon called insular drift. The islands are drifting away. And she said to me, no, they're not. They're, 
They're not drifting. Islands do not drift. That's that's what I said. I think I gotta go now. Uh, <laughs> it's the same type of response, and you go to uh, go to a restaurant, and uh, your server, male or female, kind of on the younger side, you say thank you, and they'll say no worries. Uh, I wasn't really worrying. But so it's the interesting things that some of our younger folks say sometimes. So, so but, but, but moving along, you know, you refer to the super fairy kind of on a consistent basis. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if for your Christmas gift, maybe I should find you a scale model of the beloved super fairy that was sent packing uh, after, uh, after it left Hawaii. Do you think that's something that would find a place on your mantle? No, but I'll tell you what would. Okay, somebody has to write a book about super fairy from the beginning to the end. We only, you know, this is like January 6th. We get it from the newspapers, but nobody really makes an investigative report, which is authoritative, which has all the details, all the considerations, all the players and all the implications. You know, the press that wrote it up on January 6th and 7th and 8th and thereafter didn't really, you know, cover it in as broad a spectrum of issues and considerations as, as we might want. And that's why, you know, I'm personally frustrated about the lack of a commission. Um, maybe that'll happen, maybe not. But in, you know, in the case of Superferry, we only have it from the press at the time. Uh, we don't have all the implications. We don't have all the players. We don't know what really happened. And we only know that in terms of the development of the state, it was a true disaster. Somebody has to write it up. Sort of like Michener's Hawaii or Land and Power or, you know, some of those other books that define the history of Hawaii. This is a very important point. Why? I'll tell you why. Because it covers in killer drift. That's why, which is the phenomenon that we should not ignore. Anyway, so on my Christmas mantle, Marco, if you don't mind, I know you can do this. A nice book, maybe 500 pages worth of what happened in Super Ferry. I did have a photo op, a pleasant photo op with Linda Lingle once, and I actually met her uh, after a small parade when she was running for office against uh, Maisie Hirono, uh, which she lost, uh, a small parade in downtown Kanaka Kai. So maybe I'll go to Linda Lingle and see whether uh, she could be preyed upon for an autobiography with a whole, at least a chapter or two on Super Fairy. So I don't know if I could promise a whole book, but maybe a chapter or two. I will, I will see what I can do about that. That's something like having Rudy Giuliani write a write a. a a, a history of January 6th. It's not the same thing. Don't don't talk to me about lawyers who've had their law licenses suspended. That just gets my gets my go. But moving right along. So who ho nua? Who ho nua? We had our friend Jay Griffin on two weeks ago, and he is uh, when we talked about who ho nua, he said, "Stay tuned, stay tuned." And well, I've stayed tuned, and since then, the commission has reopened the docket as they were told to do by the Hawaii Supreme Court. And there's now a schedule, and the schedule has uh, the much anticipated evidentiary hearing scheduled for drumroll January of next year. And my prediction is, uh, as I've said before, the commission will find, will rule essentially the same that they ruled before after they've had the evidentiary hearing, and that will be appealed. It will be reviewed, reviewed by the Supreme Court. It'll be appealed by Jenny Johnson and her crew at Huhonua. It may, they may sue. Uh, so Mark, Marco's prediction is that this zombie power plant will not finally, for once and for all, be put out of its misery until sometime second half of 2022. That's my prediction. Why will the result you think be different on this iteration in the Supreme Court? No, I have, oh, oh, in the Supreme Court. Well, because the court said to the commission, oh, you guys, you, you two, Leo and Jenny and Jay did not follow, did not follow what we told you to do, which is have the evidentiary hearing. So now they're following through with the evidentiary hearing, giving the commission specific bullet points, essentially you must, thou shalt take into account this and that and this and that and this and that, which they will take into account in their ruling, in their DNO. And they will pay homage to the points from the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court will say, yes, yes, well done. Yes, you did what we told you to do, which will, uh, which will not be uh, a different outcome from the first iteration. And like I said, uh, we'll get pushed back from who knew maybe another lawsuit, maybe a lawsuit in federal court, 
and uh, it'll putt putt along throughout much of 2022. Well, I, th I think you're right. Uh, I think you're right on all those points, but uh, I also hear implicitly in what you're saying is that um, you hope it, it um, uh, dries up and blows away. Um, uh, which you, I mean, you actually have been fairly candid about that in the past, Marco. But my question to you is, as a matter of policy, um, in, this, in this Netherland in which we are presently navigating, why is it better that Huho Nua blow up and dry away? It's very simple. Couple, couple reasons, Jay. One is that we can and must, especially in the Big Island, but the state in general, we must do better. We can do better. We absolutely can do better than cutting down living, breathing trees and combusting them for the generation of power at a ridiculously high rate that would be locked in, paid through the nose to the Helco ratepayer for 30 years. That's my first point. We absolutely can and must do better. And the, the, the second point is the first, same as the first and the same as the third. And everything else pales, in my view, uh, by that we can and must do better. And we absolutely have the means to do it better and cheaper than cutting down trees and burning them in that power plant. And as a codicil to that, or as an addendum to that, there are so many other uh, options on the Big Island where we're not constrained like Oahu is by room. You know, these new utility you're coming, scales- Are you coming around to support my, uh, my, my program of an undersea cable now? Uh, please don't put me on your ask list in terms of donations on that because I, I, I'm going to be rude and not respond. <laughs> okay, but we, we could have this conversation again. So at the end of the day, um, you know, you have a, a company that it argues um, that it lost two, three hundred million dollars. And you have Wall Street. This is my question. Uh, you have Wall Street looking, looking at Hawaii and thinking of all the projects where, including Superferry, by the way, uh, who lost two, three hundred million dollars. And you're wondering whether you would ever want to invest um, in a, you know, what, what amounts to a state supported initiative again, ever. Well, Jay, you know, the interesting twist, and I, I thank our friend Henry Curtis for staying on top of this, as he does stay on top of so many important things, that in the Superior Court right now in San Francisco, California, after delay, after delay, after delay, there is now a case moving forward that's going to be long, lengthy, and complicated, apparently, between one Jenny Johnson, who is the uh, kind of one of the successors of Franklin Templeton, and who's kind of top of the pyramid chain for who ho knew, amongst other things, and a couple of, of uh, of DBA, uh, I don't want to get too far out on the limb here, but different companies that she set up or that her group set up to do who ho know. She's being sued by a former business intimate, not intimate, well, I don't know about what degree of intimacy, but someone who was close in the circle there, Harold Robinson, I believe is his name, who is suing Jenny for Boku Bucks. And it's it's Jenny Johnson's position in this suit because she's, she's the defendant that, uh, the prospects for Huho Nua were always rather sketchy, were always rather questionable. So it's an interesting kabuki dance that she's doing. Uh, so apparently on one side, she's saying, according to the suit, that, well, uh, Huho Nua was always, the success of Huho Nua was always going to be kind of up in the air, right, according to the suit. And yet, the same entity, the same individual, the same team, uh, deemed it uh, okay to spend, by their own accounting, $500 million on a supposedly rather sketchy project, sketchy in terms of the prospects for success. I can't really circle that square, can you? Uh, is that your answer to my question? That is the answer to your question. Maybe you should move on for more surprises. Okay, PGV. Okay. Una Geothermal Venture, uh, near and dear to my heart. There was an article in today's uh, White Tribune Herald uh, by Stephanie Salmons uh, uh, looking at PGV. And uh, Mike Calacchini, who's the general manager there, said they're now up to 25 megawatts. So kudos to Mike and the crew there for getting closer and closer to uh, uh, the, the previous 38 megs. 
and uh, the, the, the revised and amended power purchase agreement is still in limbo land right now uh, because as Jay tried to explain uh, to us uh, last week, uh, in a little context here, so PGV, there was an environmental impact statement or report for 34 years ago, Jay, 34 years ago. It was done in 1987 with the prospect that this plant was gonna have maybe 25 or plus year lifetime, right? So now it's 34 years later, the plant is still operational, right? So the commission is saying, hey, we need to move forward. We need to have an environmental impact statement, environmental statement here, in order for us to decide whether this revised PPA, which would be in the benefit of Hawaii ratepayers, and also increase PGV output by eight megawatts, whether it's in the public interest. And the, 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 the ludicrous part of the story is essentially, okay, PGV, is the party that needs to commission, i.e. do the environmental statement, right? Okay, I got that. My brain can, can wrap myself around that. Okay, so they do the statement, they do the report, and then they got to give it to somebody, right? Uh, who are they going to give it to? Well, uh, Suzanne Case of the DLNR, Department of Land and Natural Resources said, whoa, not us. We're not taking that. We, it's not our purview to do that. And right now we have the Big Island, uh, the County of Hawaii, Mitch Roth and his crew, which are, hmm, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out whether we can take that uh, because the commission can't take it because they don't have the resources of the commission to make a judgment really whether the EIS uh, is adequate and because that's, that's not their purview, at least it hasn't been. But interestingly, environmental issues are becoming more and more the purview of the commission for a whole bunch of reasons, legislative, judicial, right? So it, it's just, okay, environmental impact statement, PGV does it, who are we gonna give it to? What's the address we mail it to guys and gals? To which the answer is, hmm, well, not sure yet. In the meantime, the price of oil is now 75 bucks a barrel, as high as it has been in several years. The, co the avoided cost of uh, the so called avoided cost rate of electricity on the Big Island is 14 cents a kilowatt hour, which is four cents more than it was at the same time last year, which was 10 cents. What's, what does that mean? That means that Big Island ratepayers are continuing to pay through the nose for avoided cost pricing that Ho Hawaii Electric Light Company, aka Hawaiian Electric, is paying for the first 25 megawatts which is now fully online, voila, from PGV. So as this bureaucratic kabuki dance, what the blank is going on with the environmental impact statement, who's gonna take it? Price of oil goes up, the price of electricity to Hawaii ratepayers goes up, and we wait, we wait, we wait, we wait. Well, PGV must be you know, happy with that because they don't have um, you know, to go into the new uh, uh, agreement yet. They make more um, money. They make, more, they make money. more money for as long as this is delayed. They make more money, yep. which is really too bad. They, I, I, my understanding is they're willing to go. Uh, they negotiated it and it took them a while, but they negotiated with a uh, Elko um, and now they're ready. But this is a sort of a bureaucratic snafu. But let me, you know, let me ask you, you know, chapter 343 of the uh, Hawaii Revised Statutes, the Hawaii Environmental Protection Act, which generated this whole thing about EIS for Hawaii, the state EIS. Right? Um, has existed for 40 years, 40 years plus. And so is this the first time this has come up where everybody looks around and vacuously and wonders who will look at my EIS? Why, why now? Uh, I have never heard of this kind of problem before. Have you? You know, I'm gonna respond to that this way, Jay. The original Supreme Court decision uh, that was in response to Henry Curtis's and Life of the Land lawsuit against the approved PPA between Helco and Huho Nua gave the Hawaii Supreme Court a chance to rule on the validity, the arguments of Henry's case, right? We know that. And the major ruling, the importance of that ruling, five to nothing, was that in such decisions as, a, as approving a PPA, for a tree burning power plant, thou shalt take into account environmental quality and environmental well being. 
that was explicit in the court decision. And I believe that that has set a precedent over the past several years where this commission and others are more acutely aware of the environmental effects and impacts of projects like this. That's my answer to that. Well, I think inherent in what you just said is, is there a little concern that whatever they do, they're operating under these new rules the Supreme Court has set, and they they run the risk of um, you know um, of an appeal of their decision, um, which is to let this EIS uh, you know take root, uh, pass, uh, be accepted, and so forth. So maybe the Supreme Court decision in Hujo Nua has made them a little skittish. Would you agree? Made who skittish? People who might step forward and be the recipients of the EIS report. Yeah, and uh, and just to kind of take it to the other end of the island chain, on the island of Kauai, uh, KIUC and AES, uh, AES being the company uh, that also has been operating the coal power plant, interestingly, on Oahu that will shut down September of next year. Uh, KIUC and AES have been working on a pumped hydro project that's WKES, West Kauai Energy Storage which you know, put simply is you take water from one elevation, you pump it up to another, and then when you need the power, you have the water run down and you spin it through a turbine, right? So as long as you have water, it's almost kind of perpetual motion machine, except of course, you'll never get the same energy out from the water coming down as it took you to pump it up, but still. And, and one of the important factors in this evaluation project for the Public Utilities Commission, they've made this explicit, is environmental concerns. So all eyes right now for a number of us looking at this particular docket before the commission, AES is looking at it very carefully, KUC is looking at it very carefully. We're all looking at uh, folks like uh, Isaac Morawaki and Earth Justice is involved as well for one of, the, one of the interveners on the docket or one of the participants on the docket. And you know, my concern is, I mean, I'm, I'm an environmentalist at heart. I got my first degree in environmental studies 40 years ago. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I'm seeing environmental concerns possibly swinging a bit too much uh, to the point of the, the uh, what is it, the perfect being the enemy of the good, that you can't, you know, there are always going to be trade-offs, right? <laughs> Life is about trade-offs. Yeah. So I'm not taking a particular position on, uh, on West Kauai energy storage, but I mean, I am concerned that especially some of these environmental organizations seem more kind of hell bent on saying no, 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 rather than yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a conversation I had with somebody from the Sierra Club back when I said, what do you guys do? What do you guys do? And he said, we stop things. We stop things. Yep. We stop things. And, and, yep. and that's true. And it's not just the Sierra Club. It's a number of activist organizations. And they go out for funding on that basis. They are paid their salaries on that basis. They hire staff and do research on that basis. They take positions in court on that. They never come up with their own initiatives, no programs, no developments. They just stop things. And we have an enormous environmental activism industry that's out there to stop things. And, and you know, the problem is the government is the, the government is concerned that once they see an activist attack on one of their projects, uh, they react, um, you know, to, to cir not circle the wagons, but be become very cautious. And so what you have is projects that get to be very cautious. Now, the, the problem with that is we do have goals and we do have at least theoretically the notion of doing renewables um, and trying to go green, um, but these objections stand in the way. And it goes, it goes back to, uh, you know, what we were saying at the very beginning, a lot of projects have gone down the tubes over this. And in my view, increasingly are going down the tubes and are likely to continue to go down the tubes. And we're not gonna reach our goals because everything's gotta be tested um, by these controversies, which is regrettable and stands in the way of uh, a progressive approach to energy. You don't have to agree. Oh, well, actually you do. Nod your head, yes or no. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the, the, the follow-ons from this, uh, as I think about it, Jay, is that if, if a big project, whether it's a Huho Nua, whether it's a PGV, whether it's a West Kauai energy storage, which is whether it's Kapolei energy storage, is you've got 
larger sums of money involved and larger possible losses, right? If the, if the endeavor, the project does not come to fruition, there's more at stake, right? More risk. Whereas if you do it on a more distributed basis by every rooftop at a time or with storage, then perhaps there's less risk. And, you know, I don't know how much time we have left here, but I mean, back again, six years ago, I feel like I'm playing this violin over and over and again. Uh, Mike Gabbard, the Senator Mike Gabbard was successful in getting a bill uh, called Community-Based Renewable Energy signed into law by IGE six years ago. And this was supposed to democratize the use of solar and allow people to benefit from it who didn't have their own roof, couldn't afford it and so forth. And now six years later, there, as of my last check, there are 298 kilowatts total of CBRE on two islands uh, across the Hawaiian Electric uh, Five service territories. So in principle, CBRE has the potential to really bridge that gap between solar haves and solar have nots. And that's one of the dockets I'm playing, paying particularly close attention to. And I believe that uh, all three of the, of the PUC commissioners now, you know, have this close to their head and close to their heart because they see the potential to democratize the benefits of solar in, 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 a, in a more uh, dramatic and cost, uh, cost effective fashion. And my view is the solar industry ought to get behind that. And the bill ought to be tuned up, obviously, it has not been successful. Uh, but the bottom line, there was an article in today's paper about how we have uh, a lot of people now losing food stamps. We have a lot of people who are taking, um, you know, government assistance, uh, increasing number of people in the state of Hawaii. Um, we have, um, you, you know, we have a, a, a great divide on, on economic wealth. And this is a problem. So we have to be thinking of democratization all the time. And for me, as I mentioned earlier, I would like to see energy democratized. I don't want to see distributed solar only on the rooftops of people who could afford to put the money in. I want to see it everywhere. And I agree with you about community solar. The legislature ought to address that. It ought to make it possible for and encourage, encourage, but tax means or otherwise, make it possible for more of that in order to democratize solar going forward. Wow, we have covered a lot of stuff, Marco. And you know, um, actually it didn't surprise me that much, but I sure appreciate it. Um, I hope you're back by the next time. And uh, if you have a guest, fine. Otherwise we'll continue this conversation. There's much more to discuss. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Pleasure as always. Aloha.